Hello, everyone, and welcome to another mini sky tonight. So one of the fun topics I've always wanted to cover over because one of the shows that we have at the SCOBY Education Center is Experience the Aurora, which you usually don't get to see until January. So I thought, why not talk about this unique phenomenon that happens near the poles around about now, what causes them and why there's such a beautiful color display in the sky and what are the different colors that we see. So let's dive into the phenomenon known as the aurora, whether it's the aurora borealis or the aurora australis. So how does it begin? Well, it starts with the sun. It's the aurora borealis and the aurora australis are actually, believe it or not, connected with our Earth's sun system. Photons and electrons are positive charge or negative charge particles and photons, which are particles of light, whether it's electrons or positrons or photons get emitted from the sun and stripped away from the sun's surface by the high temperatures of the sun at the corona. And some of those charged particles travel together because they have so much energy and they travel in this state of matter known as plasma. And this is what creates our solar wind. So all the material that's being pushed out from the sun is created by solar wind. So most solar wind is blocked by the Earth's magnetosphere. So we have this awesome magnetic field that protects us from most of the sun's radiation. Not all of it, but a good portion of it. And especially all these charged particles, which could damage a lot of things here on Earth. So every day we get bombarded by solar wind, but our magnetic field kind of protects like a shield. So instead of having like these perfectly oval shapes around our sun, they're just are perfectly oval shapes of our magnetic field around our planet Earth, the sun's solar wind causes them to be just distorted just a little bit, but still we're being protected. But sometimes certain events on our sun occur, known as coronal mass ejections, where a good chunk of material is being ejected from the sun. And that follows along with the solar cycle. Now, our sun has a magnetic field like Earth, but it's highly unstable. Since the sun rotates so fast for its size, its magnetic field starts to distort and twist, and sometimes the magnetic fields can poke out of the sun and go in and out of the sun to create solar flares and prominences. So in this image that you can see right here, some of these bright spots are points on the sun to where you have magnetic field entrance and exits. So sometimes many magnetic field lines as they're poking through the sun have a counterpart. So you have one where place where it come, goes out and another place where it goes back in. So like in this case right here, this is where it goes out and this is where it goes in and the magnetic field line kind of follows along as you kind of see right here. It creates solar flares and prominences as you kind of can see these beautiful trails right here. But sometimes that material, as you can see, like here, gets ejected out completely. And that's what is known as a solar mass ejection. So a ton of charged particles like uh, photons, electrons, positrons, etc., all get ejected out from the sun. And they flow out into space. And from there, that solar wind or that, that coronal mass ejection flows out into space. And if it interacts with our Earth, it bends the magnetosphere, so as you can see, it has the, our magnetosphere has these perfectly curly cues, but it's supposed to extend outwards, but the magnetic uh, sphere gets bent backwards so much because there's so much material being blown towards it. So it's kind of like being in like a hurricane. So if it's just a gentle breeze, like normal solar wind, eh, I can take it. But in this particular case, with a coronal mass ejection, it gets bent back so far that it snaps backwards and tries to snap back into place, as you kind of can see right here. So these magnetic field lines go all the way out here and then they try to snap back into place and some of the charged particles get caught by the snapback. And those charged particles, since they love magnetic field lines, flow up the ma our magnetic field lines to the poles and interact with our atmosphere. Now. Just a little bit of chemistry, noble gases. Noble gases, when you look at the atom of a noble gas, you have the core, which is protons and neutrons, and then you have these shells of electrons that orbit the central atom. 
those electrons, especially for noble gases, have filled up their electron shells. They don't want extra electrons and other things to connect with them. Unlike elements like, for example, oxygen, which has gaps in its electron shell, oxygen and carbon and other types of elements interact with other elements as well because they're trying to complete their outer shell. But many of your noble gases have a complete outer shell, so they don't interact with other things. And so when they get energy from all these particles that are bombarding the atmosphere, and one of these particles bounces off and, and or photons get um, absorbed by the atoms, they try to emit it back out because they want to be stable. They don't want to have excess energy. They don't want an electron stripped off. They basically just want to be in their own place. So they often release this excess amount of energy in the form of light. And we can see that light by colors. So the colors that you see in our atmosphere with all this beautiful curtaining and everything um, is created by all the different gases in our atmosphere. So the different colors that you see signify the different elements in our atmosphere and how high they are. So for example, your red colors that you usually sometimes see are your oxygens, which are over 150 miles up above the Earth's surface. So sometimes it could be ozone or sometimes it could be just a singular oxygen, but most of the, those oxygens are a, a upper part of the atmosphere. And your, sometimes your pinks too, but usually the reason being why you start getting pinks is because those oxygens just didn't receive a lot of energy, so it just only emitted just a little bit, whereas in your reds received a ton of energy in the upper part of the atmosphere, and they wanted to get rid of it as fast as possible, so they just blared out bright red. The pinks, they received a little bit of energy, and then they just blared it out in pinks. Yellows and greens are basically different types of oxygen, but they're usually lower level. So the yellows are over 150 miles, but sometimes they tend to be a mixture of red and pink a little bit, but sometimes you can have yellow as well. Greens, however, are at 150 miles or lower, usually between 60 to 150 miles. And they're usually the first colors that you see when you see an aurora. When you, so you, when you look onto the horizon towards the north, you'll start seeing the green curtains as they are up here. And then you start seeing the other colors as more of the uh, particles start to emit. Blues and violets are usually your nitrogens and argons at 60 miles above the surface. And oranges and whites, as you kind of can see here, you can see of a little bit of this orange color in here and some whites up in here. Those are just tenderly because there's just all that, all that light that's being emitted at the same time, you just see those colors. It's just blues and uh, reds emitting at the same time in some of the greens. So those different colors just basically tell us we have oxygen and nitrogen in our atmosphere. So what's the difference between Aurora Borealis and the Aurora Australis? The Aurora Borealis is in the Northern Hemisphere and the Aurora Australis is in the Southern Hemisphere. For a long time, they thought they were the same thing. In fact, many people believe that because our, we have our beautiful symmetric um, magnetosphere, they should be mirror images of it. But however, that's not the case. In 2009, researchers saw that they indeed were different. So if you saw the Aurora Borealis in the Northern Hemisphere, you're gonna see a different show in the Southern Hemisphere. And that was just because the solar wind alters our magnetosphere as you saw in the images earlier. Sometimes it can even alter in different ways, not even alter, but even warps and twists it in different ways. So sometimes you can even get a different show. And they, believe it or not, this is also confirmed in space. So as you can see this beautiful image here, this is Aurora seen from space. So you even see the beautiful color light shows from high above our planet. So speaking of space, can you see Aurora on different places? And yes, we have detected Aurora in different places. As long as the body has a strong magnetic field, and it has an atmosphere that it can interact with, 
you can get aurora. And we have seen aurora not only on Earth, but Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. It was, these were kind of first discovered by Voyagers 1 and 2. And then later on, as we've sent other spacecraft to other gas giants, we have discovered it. We haven't seen any aurora on Venus because it doesn't have a strong magnetic field as well as Mars. Even though they have atmospheres, they don't have a strong magnetic field. In fact, I would love to look at images of uh, the aurora from Uranus and Neptune. I, I wasn't able to find any that were significant, but I hope to be able to see some as we start sending spacecraft to these distant gas giants. So when and where can you find them? Because you're thinking to yourself, oh, these are such beautiful displays and people say, oh, they're a once in a lifetime thingy and you gotta do it. Well, keep in mind the near the poles most of the time. So during times where you have solar um, winds hitting us and or sometimes those coronal mass ejections do hit, if it's just a standard uh, CME coronal mass ejection, it only will have enough energy just to travel down to the Arctic Circle and just a little bit below. So places like Alaska usually tends to get a lot of aurora. So if you ever want to take an Alaskan cruise sometime, do it during the winter. Yes, I know it is super cold. It is bitterly freezing, but the winter time is the best time. And here's why. Because during the summertime, the days are much longer in Alaska than they are in the wintertime. So the chances of you seeing aurora during the summertime is very slim because that's not only its longest days and very, very short nights, but you also have the dilemma too, where that's where a lot of, of Alaska starts melting up and you start getting rainy seasons. So summertime is not necessarily the best time to go observe, even though, yes, in terms of temperature, it's much, much more comfortable. The best times are actually during the late fall, early winter. So if you want to make the hike to see a beautiful color light show, just be sure to bundle up. However, there have been times in history where we have received a huge coronal mass ejection from the sun and it has bombarded the earth to where it has enough power to extend further down into the United States, sometimes even as far as Texas. These are rare occasions, but they do indeed happen. So if you ever want to track those opportune times where it's going to be powerful enough to where you could possibly see it, obviously go away from city lights. You don't want to confuse a bright city glow with um, the aurora. And you want to have a nice clear view of the northern sky. So go far north as possible to where you have a clear dark view sky. And if it just happens to be that one time where you heard from somebody saying, hey, the aurora are going to be out tonight, look to the northern horizon to look for the green glow. And that will be your indicator of aurora. But if you want to check out when you can check uh, when those events occur, the two best sites that I've seen thus far that can track when we have major solar flares that can hit the Earth and are powerful enough, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, which has a ton of satellites up in the upper atmosphere. One of them tracks our sun. And spaceweather.com also tracks the sun. They basically can indicate to you when a huge solar flare is going to hit the earth and when to prepare to look for aurora. And if indeed it could be powerful enough to be visible from where you are. Um, I'll be sure to leave these two links in the description. So if you wanna check them out later, you're more than welcome to. So these are the beautiful color displays known as the aurora. If there is a question you would like for me to answer, leave it down in the comments below. Or if there's a comment you would like to leave behind, leave it down in the comments as well. If there's a topic you would love for me to cover over, also leave that down in the comments. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, never stop learning.